Good morning. This is the uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, April 10th, 2023, special hearing on staff's cumulative impact report and feedback from both commissioners uh, and, and the public on, the, on that report. Um, I'll be chairing today as uh, Chairman Robbins is um, traveling, uh, although Chairman Robbins is with us and will be uh, listening in here today. Uh, but to start the meeting, let's go ahead and take a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Ackerman. Here. Commissioner Cross. Present. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Oath. Commissioner Ray. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have five out of seven commissioners present. Great. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Um, you know, again, I want to thank everyone with us here today uh, for being willing to take the time uh, to be with us and to share your thoughts on the 2022 Cumulative Impacts Report that was developed over the last year. Uh, as was indicated in the report, the report is intended to establish a baseline and to inform the Commission of data, trends, and considerations to aid in the ongoing evaluation and assessment of potential cumulative impacts associated with oil and gas activities consistent with SB 19181 and Rule 904, which was developed during the mission change rulemaking. Uh, as was noted in the report, the first annual report was delivered to the commission on January 18th, 2022. The first report was intended to set the foundation and begin to set the baseline for subsequent annual reports. It also acknowledged that the first year's data was uh, limited and that the specific fields or ways to present data may need to evolve as staff and or commissioner understanding of the data uh, and or the impacts evolves. So in the second annual report, data were evaluated for oil and gas development plans or OGDPs and associated oil and gas locations uh, approved in the 2022 calendar year. Uh, this second report also includes numerous additional ways to look at information gathered into the Cumulative Impacts Data Evaluation Repository or CIDR, uh, such as enhanced graphics to more accurately represent the expanding suite of data and year-over-year -year trends to understand how these impacts may be changing over time. Three comprehensive area plans or CAPS were approved in 2022. These caps allow operators and the COGCC to look at the development plans on a broader scale, which invites discussions that may not otherwise occur, uh, e.g. more robust infrastructure and other things uh, that may inform cumulative impacts evaluations. While caps can be a valuable tool during the planning and approval process, the Form 2B, which is the cumulative impacts data identification for specific location, collects the relevant CIDR data. So for consistency and in order to compare the locations in these caps to other OGDPs, the information for OGDP locations included in these caps will be included in the year in which the OGDP is approved. Uh, the three operators who caps were approved in 2022 agreed to provide cumulative impacts data at the time they apply for the OGDPs. Long-term, additional actions may be necessary to ensure cited data are complete. And finally, this report was compiled with contributions from CDPHE's Air Pollution Control Division, or APCD, the Colorado Energy Office, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and supplements their reports and or recent presentations to the commission. So today is an opportunity for the public to share their feedback on the report itself and to provide any feedback on how we can improve the report, the data collected, and information shared in future cumulative impacts reports. It is important to note that today's public feedback session is not designed to address cumulative impacts rulemakings or any of the processes that have been occurring concurrently led by Commissioner Ackerman. There are specific forums and opportunities that have been held and will continue to be held for the interested public to provide feedback on cumulative impacts rulemakings. This rather is specific to feedback on the cumulative impacts report that has been provided in order to inform future reports on the topic. I understand that there have been almost 50 individuals who have signed up partic to participate today, which is great. Please be respectful and limit yourself to the three minutes that are allotted for each speaker 
to ensure we have time to hear from each individual who has signed up. And please ensure that your comments are focused on the topic at hand today. We always appreciate the opportunity to hear from folks and uh, I for one, am looking forward to everyone's thoughts. And so with that introduction, um, our first speaker today is Suzanne Andrews. And that will be followed by Robert Hogue and Raymond Lucas. Mr. Chair, I am looking for those individuals. I'm not seeing them right away <clears throat> in our hearing. Okay. So if they are here and you could raise your hand, that way I'll be able to identify you. Oh, I see a hand raised, one moment. So we'll be bringing Mr. Lucas in and I'll be looking for Ms. Andrews and Mr. Hogue. Great, thank you. Mr. Lucas, you have been elevated to the panel. If you want to unmute yourself and uh, show your video, we'd be interested in hearing your comments. Okay, thank you so much. Did that work for you? Uh, we can hear you, yeah. Okay, this is Al, my name is Raymond Lucas and I've lived in Colorado since 1963. I worked for public service company, then XL Energy for 31 years. I left XL Energy and executive management and fully understood how our company engaged in improving our environment and supplying safe, low cost natural gas and electricity. I retired eight years ago and I've spent many hours researching the Green New Deal. And I found that to help people become extremely rich, um, but not much else, which is also backed up by scientists. Our power plants have been cleaned up. Our vehicles and our gas industry and oil industry has made major improvements. We have spent trillions on solar and wind energy, which will always be unreliable. If the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow enough, we have nothing. But major storms wipe it out easily and reliability is poor at best. Forest fires are an untold story. We average, we still average 70,000 per year across the US. They are the heaviest polluters in the world along with homes, and building fires. They contribute from 20 to 30% of the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases annually across the US and around the world. To give you a comparison of impacts from these fires, the California fires from three years ago in just two weeks alone produced more carbon dioxide and other gas house, greenhouse gases than every vehicle combined in California did for the entire year. And we, uh, we want to focus on getting rid of gas vehicles. 90% of fires are started by humans. I fully believe the Forest Service understands these impacts along with the EPA. Yet I think the political side has kept them silent and I think they are not interested in forest fires. I wanna give a big shout out right now to the California, I mean, to the Colorado people that have taken care of our forest. They are one of the very few in the West that have gotten recognition for being better and improving and reducing forest fires. So I wanna make that clear. Uh, please put our political efforts toward forest fires and funding new refineries and oil cleanup processes before you destroy our most efficient and reliable energy products. Remember 30 years ago, Exxon Energy was forced to shut down a, a nuclear power plant that produced electricity at 1.2 cents per kilowatt hour. It was and is a safe product when controlled properly. Where are we today? Let's build 25 new nuclear plants so we can build electric cars. Now research tells us that the process of building electric cars and batteries and running them throughout their lifetimes produces more carbon and greenhouse gases than modern gas cars. Please focus on reducing forest fires and we will exceed our air quality standards. It's time to be honest and real. Don't follow the politicians and the environmentalists. Please follow the facts that you guys know. And again, a big shout out to our people in Colorado because they've done a fabulous job. I just wished all the rest of them would take care of that. I've sat in my house here in Northern Colorado and I watched the brown cloud come across the, the, the ridge a lot of times in the summer. And I look it up and there's always 50 or 60 forest fires burning to the west of us, very seldom in Colorado. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Lucas. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Cat to provide comments, uh, hopefully on the topic of the cumulative impacts report. I'm ready. Hi, my name is Mark Cott. I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, cows, milk, and cheese. After graduating from high school in 1971, I boarded a plane with a friend, flew to Denver, rented a car, and drove all over the state. Did not take me long before I said, someday 
I want to live here. In 1995, that opportunity came. The thought of hiking, skiing, camping, hunting, and fishing, I could not wait. And since moving here, I've done it all. I've experienced what real thin air is like on top of a 14er. I saw my skis and legs disappear in fresh powder snow. Today, I live in Westminster, just north of Denver. I've done a number of jobs. For several years, I was a letter carrier for the United States Postal Service. But most of my time I spent as a licensed residential electrician. It's possible that I may have stuffed mail in your mailbox or done some electrical work at your home. As an electrician, I know, as you do too, that electricity needs to be generated. At present, the cleanest, most efficient, and inexpensive means of generating electricity is through oil and gas provided by our Colorado oil and gas companies. Before retiring as an electrician, I worked as a TSA officer out at DIA. Well, that was an interesting job to say the least. Recently, a friend asked me, did you ever have to arrest somebody at the airport? I laughed. I said, nope, that wasn't my job. My job was to keep people safe when flying. Your job too is to keep people safe and to protect our environment. Whether flying to a vacation resort or driving to a local grocery store or flipping on the light switch in your home or grilling that thick juicy steak in the backyard barbecue, all these activities require oil and gas. With increased regulations, these fun activities which we enjoy will cost us more as well. Today, I urge you to please vote against these increased regulations. I want to thank you for keeping Colorado clean. And I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cap, for your comments uh, and being with us here today. Um, just, just so it's clear, there's no votes being taken today and there's no decisions being made. We're hearing about feedback on the cumulative impacts report that was provided. Uh, on the website and was developed over the last year. Um, and so I uh, would appreciate comments associated with that. So thank you for being here today. Uh, I think next up we have... Uh, Ms. Birdwell? Ms. Bridewell. Or Bridewell, forgive me, thank you. Ms. Bridewell, uh, you're elevated to the panel. If you wanna unmute yourself uh, and if you show choose, you can show us uh, your video and we'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Okay, am I on now? We can hear you. Okay, hello, I'm Catherine Bridwell. I'm from Wellington, Colorado. I am a ranch owner. I am a thir uh, third generation. My daughter is the fourth generation on this range. We live a mile east of the Rawhide Power Plant in Wellington. My grandfather bought from a homesteader in about 1912 and retired in 1949. My dad bought some ranch from grandpa and ran it until 1982 when he retired. He leased the, the ranch he passed in 1910. Rented, or er, I have mineral rights. I have water rights. I miss the lease. Uh, money's coming in. He did dry land farming, wheat, barley, sedan grass for hay. We had chickens. We had pigs for food. Uh, he bought and leased land over the years to increase production. He retired in 1982 and passed in 1910, or two, 2010. Also leased some land from the Bureau of Reclamation in until 2009, still leasing for grazing and prefer grazing oil and gas. It only takes one section of land instead of the whole property. Uh, I am not in favor of solar. I am not in favor of turbines because they throw out toxic 
uh, elements into the environment. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bridwell, for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Nelson. Yes. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Chris Nelson. I live in Loveland. The regulations that you are considering are of great concern to the economy in our area. I would like to caution you when you consider these regulations as the long range effects it has on our communities. At one point in my life, I was in an industrial accident. I almost lost my right leg. It's been brought to my attention that in Weld County in 2020, the tax revenue from oil and gas was 3.3 million. In the next year, after the regulation in 2021, there was only $142,000 collected. This is one thirtieth of the amount of revenue collected for the county in one year after regulation. Without energy from these counties, we cannot generate electricity or move products to market. There is not enough jobs and there's more unemployment. Oil out of the ground is the lifeblood of these counties and their economies. Without the support of oil and gas, the economy, uh, economy through taxation, there would not be firemen to come and save people's lives and ambulances to drive them to the hospital. We can see that this is what is happening to economies of different municipalities. These regulations are far more reaching than most people realize. The regulations that you would put in place would affect the entire economy and mostly the people who can least afford it. The folks who produce products and sell them through small businesses. This will raise the cost of living for the people of the state of Colorado. I urge that you do not add or increase any more regulation on oil and gas. Uh, I thank you for your time. Uh, I think the Colorado uh, regulations on oil and gas are stronger than they are in any other state in the union and they produce over a billion dollars in tax revenue. It's very important that we do not strangle this industry. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Nelson, for being here with us today and providing your thoughts. <clears throat> uh, I wanna emphasize again, although it appears this may be a losing battle, that there's no regulations being discussed today, no votes being discussed today um, that we're here to discuss the cumulative impacts report that was developed and ways to uh, improve data collection uh, and the process of developing that cumulative impacts report moving forward for 2023. Um, I hope that comments can be specific to that topic, um, but I will uh, certainly allow folks to speak their thoughts. So Ms. Larson, I think next we have Mr. Austin, is that what I see? That is correct. Mr. Austin, um, you can unmute yourself and share your screen or share your picture should you choose to, uh, and we'll listen to your thoughts here now. All right. Hi, my name is David Austin. I live in Windsor, Colorado, which is in Weld County. Um, you see here that the well, regulations that are imposed on oil and gas will make it hard for my family that works in the oil fields of Weld County and myself that has a job delivering packages for Amazon and Vivo with the two companies I work for would rise up fuel costs for me as well. Not just also that of the electricity bill that is generated from oil and gas as well. I am a avid fisherman and an outdoors guy, but everything in my life has been touched by oil and gas. You know, just to see this uh, state, certain parts of the state, go to certain lakes, I have to drive there, I have to, you know, pay gas to do things with. And, you know, most people don't realize that how much oil and gas has been a part of a, a person's life. 
everything we touch from our cell phones to our cars to our you know stuff that is built in our our building products in our homes are all touched by oil and gas or built by oil and gas without without trucks cars and everything that takes building materials to get one place to another would be a simple heart headache and put it all in a nutshell like our president has stated we still need oil and gas for the next 50 years and that was a, an address that I sent me on YouTube. So you look at our electric cars that produce more CO2 than our average car that I drive, which is a minivan to do my job with. And I just can't believe it, you know. But anyway, that I really think that you should rethink really over these regulations how it will affect certain people's lives and that my family is livelihood at stake because they work work their lives in the oil field to keep a roof over their head for their families and thank you for listening to my comment thank you mr austin ms larson Who's next? Uh, so let's see here. Mr. Hawkins declined to join um, the meeting. If Shannon Erdman would like to speak, you can, oh, give me one moment. Oh, Mr. Hawkins does wish to speak. So we'll bring Mr. Hawkins in. Mr. Hawkins, you're with us on the panel. If you want to unmute yourself, uh, we'd be happy to hear your thoughts. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't have my glasses on. I couldn't read what came up on the screen. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, my name is Bill Hawkins, and I have lived and worked in Colorado off and on for over 40 years. My children have attended CSU and Mesa State, and two of them still reside in Colorado. Three of my Karen children also enjoy the benefits of living in Colorado. I have seen many changes over my 40 years in the oil and gas industry, most of them for the betterment, some of them head scratchers. And while everybody is demanding instant changes, what took years to reach will also take years to attain the desired results. My main example is the acid rain issue that affected the northeast part of the country. It took over 20 years to resolve those issues as the coal fired plants were converted to natural gas, the acid rain began to abate. I feel that the current regulations to be given a chance to take effect before implementing more regulations. I do not believe that these reports actually accurately reflect the entire situation, but only selected areas. And the very reports you cite are the ones that will be used to impose more stringent regulations unless we can give the current ones time to take effect. And I know one thing we're all short in nowadays is patience, but I would appreciate that. Thank you for your time and your consideration for listening to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Ms. Erdman, you have been elevated to the panel. Uh, if you would like to share your thoughts, uh, we're listening. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for letting me speak with you today. My name is Shannon Erdman. I hold three degrees, one in environmental science, one in occupational health and safety, and the other in engineering. I'm a fourth generation Coloradan, mother of three girls, grandmother of eight girls, one boy, and another one on the way. My roots are very deep in Colorado from my ancestors that endured travel, the treacherous travel, um, and came to Colorado and homesteaded on the Eastern Plains. To my grandchildren, who are the fifth generation Coloradans, I've never wanted to live anywhere else and will always want to live here because we have all four seasons. We have an impressive list of state and natural uh, national parks and taking a weekend drive is always a favorite thing to do. It used to be one of the best places to start a family and retire um, to Colorado because the costs were so much lower than other big cities. Now, unfortunately, I'm working two jobs to make ends meet. I had planned to retire at 67. I just don't think it's possible now. With the rising costs of everything from inflation to grat to gas to groceries. It's worth 
for the youth um, just starting out here in Colorado. My family members are not alone in this predicament. Every family, whether starting out or retiring, are really having to question whether or not they can afford Colorado. The average cost of a one bedroom apartment is over $1,000 per month. Um, my mom, that's all she makes. She makes $1,000 after working her entire life um, off of social security. So how can somebody retire here? We simply can't afford to make everything more expensive. Um, when we don't know the real return on investment, Colorado has always been very conscientious about our environment and our safety and our Colorado lifestyle. We simply just can't afford to make it more expensive. Oil and gas production is absolutely critical to the delicate fiscal balance in our beautiful state. Oil and gas um, benefits Colorado's energy um, industry, contributes billions of dollars, and uh, holds hundreds of thousands of good jobs. I'm a recipient of one of those jobs. My second job is in oil and gas, and without it, I might have to actually look at public assistance. Like all of you, I want a safe and healthy state, but we simply have to be guided by common sense and a balance of what it takes to ensure the state's longevity for generations to come. I just urge you to follow the heart of a true Coloradan that value conservation, the environment, and our way of life. Just consider the impact of everything that we have in place before change, making any changes, even with the impact study. Please do not make it more difficult for oil and gas industry in Colorado. It's very needed. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Erdman. Um, I believe next up we have Ms. Helmer. Ms. Helmer, you've been elevated to the panel. If you wanna unmute yourself, uh, we'd be happy to hear your thoughts. Ms. Helmer. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. Pushing the wrong unmute button. Okay. I can hear you now. Thank you. And um, good morning, commissioners. I'm ha happy to have a chance to um, say what I think. Uh, my name is Sherry Helmer and I live in Colorado Springs. I'm a fourth generation native and recently retired from public education as an elementary teacher. I enjoy spending time with my six grandkids who also live in Colorado and fifth generation natives. I enjoy love, I joy and love attending their outdoor soccer games. I spend many hours in some of the beautiful parks that oil and gas has funded for the benefit of youth sports and walking trails for all to enjoy. Uh, I benefit my health by walking outdoors. I weekly hike with retired teachers. I participate in multiple exercise classes like line dancing and spend a lot of time outdoors. And I value having good air quality that allows me to spend time outdoors. I care about the environment of my community and our state. I believe in clean air quality. And, and I also know about the cumulative impact statement, which would put additional regulation and strain on the oil and gas industry in Colorado. Colorado has an abundant resources in oil and gas and minerals, which these precious, precious resources should benefit the state and our country without adding additional regulations to which it would most likely add extra costs to the consumer, delay time to produce oil and gas. Not only would the impact oil and gas production, it would also affect our economy by slowing down the industry, leading to possible layoffs and loss of jobs. And I know that the air quality has been downgraded and is probably, um, I think Colorado does a great job fighting wildfires uh, but California, other states surrounding Colorado have also had wildfires that there's, their smoke um, ends up in our state. Uh, but anyway, I just know, I know you're not here to vote on the cumulative impact statement, but I ask you to consider um, that um, not to add extra strain to the oil and gas industry which benefits our economy and our need for resources they produce. We live independent, work, and enjoy this great state with those resources. Thank you for your time, consideration on this very important matter and ripple effect that it, it might have if it's passed. 
Thank you, commissioners. Thank you for your thoughts, Ms. Helmer. Next up is Mr. Hinneman. Thank you. Uh, it's pronounced Heineman, but I, I appreciate it. So, uh, hey, thanks, guys. My name is Mark Heineman. Uh, thanks for giving us the time to provide feedback on the cumulative impact support. Uh, I read the report, 77 pages, took a bunch of notes, and I think it's awesome. Uh, it's very comprehensive, um, but it, it's missing one key idea, specifically the positive cumulative impacts of oil and gas in Colorado. I didn't really see anywhere in the entire report that it talks about how oil and gas adds to the state and adds benefit to the state. You know, it outlines water usage, land usage, distance to oil and gas wells, uh, and facilities to waterways, et cetera, but it misses a lot on you know, all the benefit that oil and gas adds. One example that comes to mind, and so why I think this is important is because if, people, if we use this report and reports like it to decide how to govern and make decisions about oil and gas development in Colorado, then we're missing a big piece of the whole picture. And so one example that comes to mind is um, water usage in the state. So in the report, it says that we used 288 million barrels of water in 2022, which sounds like a ton, sounds like a bunch of water. But if you look at how much water Colorado used in 2022, that's really only between half and 1% of the total water usage. Meanwhile, agriculture used between 85 and 90% of the water. So, you know, almost 100 times, 100 fold what oil and gas used. A um, little background on me from my perspective. Um, I've got a lifelong passion producing energy for America and the world. I'm a Colorado native and environmentalist, Eagle Scout, mountaineer, backpacker, avid snowboarder, and skier. Um, I'm also a licensed professional engineer in Colorado. And I spent my career uh, building energy projects in Colorado and throughout America. So my background gives me kind of a unique opportunity to study energy projects of all kind. And I become, become convinced that um, through my objective analyses, which originate in physics and first principles, um, that if we use more energy dense fuels like oil, gas, and nuclear, then we'll maximize the prosperity for humanity. Um, you know, a prescient example that comes to mind is from a stat that I saw just this morning back to water. Uh, throughout the world, there's going to be women and girls today, just today, that will spend 200 million hours cumulatively collecting clean water for their communities. And we don't have to do that in Colorado, and we don't have to do that in America because we're actively using oil and gas to move water and filter water and clean water. Um, and that's that's a cumulative impact, right? And if, without highlighting that in reports like this and showing really the true cost benefit of using these resources. I mean, the report covers a lot of the negative problems of oil and gas that are just you know part of doing business in Colorado, but it doesn't outline all of the positives that are covered also, which are huge cumulative impacts. So with that, I would, um, advocate that the commission in future reports and perhaps adding to this report, consider the positives. How much tax revenue did we create? What kind of economic prosperity was created? What kind of benefits came to our community from it? Thank you. Thank you for being here today and thank you for providing your thoughts on the report. Um, I think next up we have Mr. Yassi. And I apologize in advance because I'm sure I did not say that correctly. That's that's close enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak here. And yeah, so uh, thanks for the time. Uh, my name's Steve Yossi. Been a Colorado resident for 47 years. I'm coming to you from our family cabin here on the western slope on the Colorado River near Dotsero. Um, it's been in the family since the early 50s and seen all this state go through a lot of changes and growth. So I care about the environment, water, clean air, all this for future generations, which the report uh, puts out there. Um, as a small business owner who spent his career working in the energy sector, I'm proud to say I've worked in oil and gas and I've seen this industry work to meet the standards that have been put on it and the things that, uh, so that we're producing some of the cleanest, safest, environmentally friendly product production on the planet. Um, and it's production's vital to the lifestyle we've all come to expect. Um, so no matter which side of the aisle you're on, there isn't something in our lives that isn't affected by oil and gas. We take for granted everything that is dependent on it. We'd be living in the Stone Age without it. 
in regard to the report on page 41 of air quality, I think one thing the report doesn't take into effect is the, um, it, 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 there's assumptions that are made um, when it, with the, the amount of uh, input that oil and gas actually has and doesn't, I know they mentioned wildfires and the report is pretty lengthy, it was pretty hard to dig through, but I think we just need to consider that we are producing some of the cleanest uh, oil and gas in the world and um, we're, we're doing everything we can to uh, provide. I appreciate everything you guys are doing as commissioners on this panel to uh, provide clean energy here for Colorado. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being here and providing comments and uh, appreciate the comments being targeted to the report. So thank you. Um, next up is Ms. Scatbird. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, so in regards to the cumulative impact report, I'm reviewing page 66, which uh, discusses rope permitting, which is routine or predictable emissions. Um, I'm just curious, it talks about opening thief hatches. Uh, did the commission read or review the API standards, which the industry holds themselves to? Because several years ago, the two major producers in the DJ Basin uh, wrote a new standard called eight, Chapter 18.2, which specifically refers to methods to use to determine the quality and quantity of crude oil being loaded from a lease tank to a truck trailer without requiring direct access to a lease tank gauge hatch. So this is no longer commonplace to climb a tank and open a thief hatch per the industry's own self-regulation. Um, so I would implore the COGCC to uh, attend API standards meetings and review those standards before uh, creating a, an image that uh, routine tank gauging and thief hatch opening is commonplace within the industry, because I don't believe it is uh, due to quite a bit of uh, experimentation and work done by API members working in the DJ Basin to uh, reduce and, and potentially eliminate thief hatches being opened at all. So that's kind of my comment. Uh, thank you for listening to me today. Thank you, Ms. Gatberg, for being here and sharing your thoughts and uh, being specific about some comments on the commission report. So thank you. Thank you. Next up is well, um, Ms. McNear. If she would, she is coming in as a panelist. Good morning, Ms. McNear. Uh, you are impaneled. If you'd like to unmute yourself, we'd be interested in your thoughts. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Just one second. Let me grab my notes. I thought it was up a little bit later, but you guys are going fast. Dear COGCC, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Candace McNear. My husband is a fifth generation Coloradoan and I am a fourth generation Coloradoan. We have lived in Colorado our entire lives. My husband owns an oil field casing company in Greeley, Colorado for the past 16 years. We employ 20 to 25 men. We provide a good living and good benefits for our very hardworking guys who are family to us. Please just to not continue to add increased regulations, Colorado, that already has the strictest regulations in the United States. Without energy, we can't move forward. Our cost of living has skyrocketed in the last two to three years. We have increased gas prices, increased cost of energy, increased cost of food, increased medical costs. More regulations require more fuel costs. Also, property taxes continue to climb all over Colorado. Without oil and gas in Colorado, our property taxes will continue to climb. Oil and gas provides over $1 billion yearly to support schools, education, fire departments, roads and bridges, and multiple other departments. For example, in Larimer County, they are looking at banning all oil and gas and fracking in Larimer County. Property taxes are double what it costs to live in Weld County. For example, Weld County produces about 90% of oil and gas revenue in the state. Luckily, Weld County continues to favor oil and gas 
and companies that support them and their property taxes support this. We are moving from Larimer County. We currently have a patio home valued at $700,000 and property taxes are $6,600 a year. We are moving to Weld County, a property valued at $1.5 million. Property taxes are $3,800 a year. Wow, what a difference. Larimer County taxes are double the cost of a property that is half the value of the home in Weld County. What is happening is there are just costs all over the place. We um, just need to look at what oil and gas provides for the state of Colorado. Our primary company we work for is Chevron, which has the highest regulations in the world. Since we are a small business, all these regulations continue to impact our lives negatively and increase our costs to run a small business. Please think long and hard about regulations in the state of Colorado. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. McNear. Uh, next up, uh, we have Marilee. Hello. Hello, it looks like you are unmuted and so feel free to provide your comments. Okay. Hello, my name is Marilee Tohill. I moved to Colorado in 1967 with my husband, who was then a geologist in the booming oil industry. There were 2,000 geologists in Denver. We loved beautiful Colorado and we took up skiing, camping, and fishing and started our family. We were a prospering middle-class family. Then in the mid to late 80s, the oil industry just seemed to collapse. I'm not sure why there was talk of breaking up the big oil companies or foreign countries holding down prices of a barrel of oil. I just know the effect that it had on me and my family. My husband became unemployed and also many of our friends. Even with his master's degree and 25 years of experience, he was unable to find other employment. This led to a divorce and I had to return to work as a single mom raising three sons. The oil and gas industry seems to get a bad rap as a nasty big business, but oil and gas has provided energy to uplift the living standards of people all over the world and also provided good paying jobs for many. I know from my ex-husband that there are still good stores of oil and gas here in Colorado. So since we have it available, it would be less expensive to produce it here and keep the energy more affordable in the state of Colorado. As a senior citizen that on a fixed income, that's very important to me. On another note, one of my sons operates a water treatment plant in, in West, on the western slope of Colorado. He tells me that because California has put such strict regulations against oil and gas, California is now demanding more water from the Colorado River. And in that light, it cuts down on the amount of water we have for our state. And that also any increases in the cost of energy increase the, the uh, cost of treating and delivering water to us. I hope that you'll consider the positive impacts that uh, the oil and gas industry has in Colorado. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Tohill, for being here and sharing your thoughts today. Uh, Mr. Chair, so Ms. Jewell declined to be a participant. Um, it looks as if Michelle Favre is going to be speaking next. Great. Oh. Am I unmuted? <laughs> you are unmuted. Uh, feel free to share your thoughts with us. Okay. Uh, my name is Michelle Favre. Not only am I a Colorado native, but I'm a fourth generation Coloradoan from the Western Slope. My family has been in this state for around 90 years. I'm also an alumni of the University of Colorado. My roots run deep within this state. I come from a family of builders and caretakers. For example, my grandfather cared for and maintained the city parks in Grand Junction, among other jobs. 
My father, despite being a member of Future Farmers of America in high school, decided to spend his 40 year career as a union iron worker, primarily in California, building skyscrapers, bridges, airports, and toward the end of his career, the giant three blade windmills. My family also enjoyed the outdoors, hunting, fishing, and camping, which means we believe in being good stewards of the land, air, and water. What we don't believe in is regulating, <clears throat> excuse me, industries into extinction that built this state, such as oil and gas, farming and ranching. I believe all of us here today want to maintain the beauty of Colorado with pure water and clean air. That there, that there are ways to achieve these goals while still maintaining a robust and thriving economy. At the same time, being grateful for the blood, sweat and tears poured into our state by previous generations. When I was asked to participate in this hearing, I took the time to read the 78 page report. What caught my attention began on page 64 under the guise of rulemaking. These are not common sense regulations. These open-ended regulatory possibilities are not only invasive to oil and gas, but other industries as well. This document, which is based in data shortfalls, hypotheticals, and cautions by your own staff members, wants to include at minimum prohibitions on gas powered lawnmowers, appliances, and a maintenance schedule for my own personal vehicle. I find these regulations beyond invasive, as well as a violation of my civil liberties. The oil and gas industry has made tremendous strides in innovation over the decades, and I believe they will continue to do so. The current laser focus on this industry does not give free license to invade home and property of the state's citizenry. In an age of I want what I want when I want it, there are large economic and societal safety needs that surpass the desires and wants of a few. Despite our differences on regulatory procedure, I believe we can conserve our habitats and resources without displacing families from jobs and homes, unless the goal is to eradicate industries that have economically built our state. Thank you. Thank you for being here today and providing your thoughts. Uh, Mr. Sandberg, I see you are with us. Feel free to unmute yourself and share your thoughts with us. Oh, Mr. Sandberg, we can't hear you. You're unmuted on Zoom. Perhaps you're muted on your computer. There, that should do it. Yep, we can hear you. Do you have my audio now? We can hear you, yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, feel free to start. I'm Martin Sandberg. I've got an Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering, and I'm a member of the IEEE Power Society. And um, I've lived in Colorado for over 20 years now, and I've had some hard experience with overregulation. It wasn't anything as complex as oil and gas regulation. We were simply trying to build a house in Boulder. We had a property under contract, had our architect draw up and submit the plans we liked to the Boulder County planners. The response we got back from them was, we were approved for construction as long as no part of the structure broke the 5,825 foot line. That was two feet below grade, meaning we could only build an underground house. This shocking response meant that we had to tell a poor property owner we couldn't purchase his property. In light of that experience, I don't think I've seen anything quite as ambitious as this second annual report on evaluation of cumulative impacts. I'm no expert on reading bureaucracies, but that is simply an enormous amount of proposed actions. Just the size and scope of it will discourage a lot of oil and gas development in Colorado. Since this industry here is already the most highly regulated in the U.S., I don't think this rush to implement more regulation is a good idea. I'm actually going to kind of make location here. I'm looking out my east window at the south dam of the new Chimney Hollow Reservoir being built truly massive civil engineering project, but we all know it simply has to be built. In spite of the fact that more earth is gonna be moved than the entire Colorado oil and gas industry will move in years. Oil and gas are just about as important as water in Colorado. We have to heat our houses, drive long distances, plow snow. And I'm a member of a road association, so I pay to maintain my own road. And if the price of fuel goes up, that gets difficult. We shouldn't be trying to hamper oil and gas development any more than we would hamper water development. 
So I asked the commissioners, consider not just the number of actions being proposed in the annual report, but the effect of overregulation on the oil and gas industry that brings so much prosperity to our state. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Sandberg, for being here today and sharing your thoughts. I think next up we have Ms. Jewell. Ms. Jewell, if you want to unmute yourself, we'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Good morning, and thank you today for allowing public comment regarding the cumulative impact statement. My name is Janet Jewell, and I am a longtime resident of Colorado. I've spoken before to your commission, and I'm speaking today because I, I've realized that some of these uh, statements in this impact statement, I'm repeating myself on the word statement, but they seem rather broad and they also don't seem real specific and they're seeming to be more ways that you're going to regulate the oil and gas industry. When I feel that it ha we have some of the most stringent regulations and they have done a very good job, these oil and gas industries, of bringing on new people, new technology, new ideas, new innovative ways to keep our environment safe and to keep our, our lands and our air quality and everything else, knowing that this is a huge concern to the whole population in our state. And I'm very concerned about that as well because I do enjoy being out in our open spaces and spending time outdoors, but I never worry about the quality of the air I'm breathing. I've never had any experience in, uh, except being up at very high altitudes of being out of breath. And I feel that we really do have to consider these other people that the oil and gas industry gives great jobs for people in this state. And we've relied on them. They are the driver of the economy in Colorado. They always have been, and I want them to continue to be. I also know that I'm a retired school teacher and a grandmother, and I want good, solid education for my kids. This industry over the past several years has contributed $1 billion in tax revenues. So I'm concerned about where these revenues are going to come from. If we keep regulating oil and gas and keep trying to stop everything we use, including things in our homes, like the gas in, in our homes and the stoves and things that we use, we need these things and we can't stop having them. And when I'm going back to the school teacher idea is that this money, the tax revenues, help our schools to be strong school districts in our state and, and attract quality, good teachers. And we need those people. And so I just, uh, I really do believe that the tax revenue for me is a big, big concern. We will lose so much revenue if we limit the oil and gas companies to what they can do for us. I also believe that we're the fifth in the country for production. And we can't lose that. We need this industry. They are the main driver of the economy. So this impact statement will affect everybody. So please consider the negative impacts that this cumulative impact statement will have on so many people in the oil and gas industry, as well as Colorado families, which includes you on this commission and me as well. We already are seeing tough times. Financially, I'm a, you know, living on a fixed income as a retiree, and some of you may be headed that way someday too, but we have to stop these costs rising in things that are going on in our state and to be able to afford to attract strong businesses and other people to live in Colorado. So my ask for you today is to keep the present regulations that you've already put in place and with this cumulative impact statement, please do not add anything that will limit our freedom and liberty and for the oil and gas to continue to be strong and stay strong for us for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jewell, for your thoughts. Um, it is a cumulative impacts report, not a statement, and it's developed uh, from information that's provided by industry and in their cumulative impacts reporting. Um, with that, we'll go on to our next uh, public commenter, which is Ms. Nakam. I apologize. I'm not sure I pronounced your last name correctly. Uh, Rose Nakam. Nakam. Feel free, uh, Ms. Nakam, to start. 
<clears throat> I just wanted to say I've always loved Colorado. Uh, I'm a retired chem lab tech, and my husband is a retired Air Force officer and electrical engineer. We lived in Colorado continuously for the last 37 years. We chose to live in Colorado after leaving regular duty in the military to pursue other work options. We came back to Colorado where I grew up and where we had gone to college in between my husband being enlisted Air Force and an officer. We love the climate, the mountains and the plains. There were long lines in the 60s, in the 70s and 80s in the gas stations, people hoping to be able to fill up their cars because of the OPEC crisis. And in the 80s, because of the other gas prices, gas crisis, millions of jobs were lost. We can't have that happen again. Now due to a humongous increase in the cost of fuel, the cost of living has gone up tremendously. Food sometimes double the, the cost it was a few months ago. Uh, the cost of fuel for transportation, public, personal, and shipping greatly affects the bottom lines of homes, businesses, especially farmers, which makes life especially difficult for the lower income people add the rise in taxes to that and many can't even put a roof over their heads or feed their families or afford the gas to go to work. That kind of drastic change should never have been allowed to happen. When we are energy independent and have reasonable regulation, crises like what is happening now would be non-existent. We cannot depend on foreign countries for our energy needs ever again nor allow foreign governments to dictate to us or have control of how we function. Controlling when we get fuels, how much we can get and what we will pay for their much less valuable dirty oil, which will cause even more pollution trying to clean it up. It's better to use the oil we produce here. We now have the highest levels of costly burden burdensome regulations and the safest procedures for oil and gas production processing transporting available anywhere, especially as compared to the Middle East and China. And uh, I read through the statement and I focused on the table number six, uh, maximum ozone contributions. I calculated the percentages, the total per for uh, the gas use, oil and gas, and the natural occurrences. The, the production and of oil and gas and uses of oil and gas amount to 38% of the ozone pollutants. The other 62% is from wildfires and other naturally occurring sources. Lowering the, uh, the allowable rate for the oil and gas will not fix the effect from the largest contributor, which is nature. And adding more regulations would simply add more tax, more cost to the lowest income people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Newcomb, for your thoughts today. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, um, we've been going through the list. I'm not able to find, let me, sorry. Okay, Mr. Jewell declined my request to join. We do have Mr. David Frank in the meeting and I'll elevate him. Um, Lori Anderson is also on the list to speak. I have not seen her yet. I'll continue to look for her. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Um, so Mr. Frank is up next then, although I don't see him on the panel. He should be coming in in just a second. Okay. Let me try this one more time. Good morning, Mr. Frank. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Apologies, I, I was clicking the panelist button. Uh, so uh, good morning, members of the COGCC. I'm David Frank, the Energy and Environmental Program Specialist for the Town of Erie. And I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Town of Erie about the Cumulative Impacts Report. Obligatory background. Uh, the town of Erie is located in the Northern Front Range Urban Corridor and is host to 135 active oil and gas wells, uh, as well as 212 plugged and abandoned wells within our municipal boundary. 
Additionally, uh, a further 295 active wells and 173 plugged and abandoned wells are located within 2,000 feet of the town, uh, with 19 new wells to be added with the construction of the recently approved Coslet East location. Cumulative to oil and gas impacts, Erie is also host to a large regional landfill with a total footprint of approximately 325 acres, which accepts roughly 130,000 tons of solid waste each month, including drill cuttings from regional oil and gas projects. Vehicle emissions, wildfires, and other urban pollutants also affect the town, which is located in the heart of the US EPA, Denver Metro North Front Range ozone non-attainment area, recently expanded and reclassified from moderate to serious non-attainment status. Uh, our primary request uh, and suggestion is that the report include not just assessments, but actions to address impacts from oil and gas uh, and their cumulative contribution to other non-oil and gas impacts, uh, primarily to climate, to ozone formation, uh, and to communities uh, near oil and gas development. We're encouraged that the COGCC is considering additional cumulative impacts provisions uh, to the mission change rulemaking, and in this process, we recommend that the report include a thorough description of how the commission intends to make use of the cumulative impacts data to determine what will be done to accurately address those impacts. One key thing missing from the report is recognition that cumulative impacts of oil and gas production occur not just on the site of the drilling and production, but the impacts also accumulate regionally. Currently, Operators are only required to describe impacts from their proposed activities within a one mile radius, falling far short of a comprehensive cumulative impact analysis. We ask that the focus shift from minimizing impacts to addressing the full cumulative effects of new oil and gas operations and their cumulative relationships with other non oil and gas impacts, particularly in population centers and disproportionately impacted communities. Cumulative impact uh, thresholds should be set and should take into account whether additional impacts should be permitted at all in a region already beset by excessive impacts. Uh, thank you for your time and the opportunity to have our community's voice heard, uh, and I look forward to the opportunity to comment on potential rulemakings at the appropriate time in the future. Cheers. Thank you, Mr. Frank, for your comments and uh, for being here with us today. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing Ms. Anderson in the meeting. So that does conclude the public comment portion of our hearing. I don't, oh, someone has raised their hand. Mr. Lowe, here we go. We'll be bringing John Lowe in to provide comment. Okay, and I will iterate to anyone that um, is listening that if they have public comments or we're not able to provide public comments today, that we do accept written public comments. We have received two written public comments uh, to this hearing, one from uh, API and COGA, and one from uh, RV Nord. Um, but if, even if you spoke today and you wanna provide uh, the comments that you provided verbally today in a written format, we'd be happy to take those um, as well. So thank you for that. And with that, Mr. Lowe, you're impaneled. If you wanna unmute yourself, uh, we'd be happy to hear your thoughts. Mr. Lowe, you are still muted. Um, it appears Mr. Lowe is raising his hand. Mr. Lowe, if you want to unmute yourself, we'd be able to hear you. You are on the panel. There you go. Is that good? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, my name is John Lowe, and I speak for both me and my wife. We operate a very small business. We have been Colorado natives for over 45 years. I'm a military veteran, Air Force. So know that a lot of my perspective is from a 30,000 foot level. My wife is a retired teacher that taught for over 50 years. As grandparents, we are concerned about the balance between our individual freedoms and the role state, federal and local governments play in our lives. Of course, we're concerned about the air quality in Colorado. We both grew up in the Denver area and we remember the brown cloud following the Platte River. We no longer see that cloud. And we believe that we have, that has been a result <clears throat> of the cooperative and we emphasize cooperative effort between government and private industry. We have lived in Morgan County for 40 years. So we've seen the issues facing the front range in contrast to the issues facing rural Colorado. In our opinion, 
is that the solution to solving these issues should be adapted to meet those specific problems by specific areas of the state instead of a shotgun regulation for everyone. We are all electric at our resident. This winter, we had a monthly electric bill that exceeded $400. And to add to this inflation, it affects every part of our lives and business. We initially installed and currently use a solar heat and hot water heating system. So we are trying to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Our operation works well for us so we can divide our time between business and spending time with family. We are now at a point where we can't continue to add costs for transportation and operating expenses and to live the lifestyle we've worked hard to achieve. We have family from the front range to eastern, the eastern border. Our grandkids are active in both school and club activities. As I said, it is important for us to be able to balance our time between work and family. It's getting harder to do that with the continued rise in energy costs coupled with inflation. One granddaughter that while in high school still works 20 plus hours a week. Transportation costs are an issue for her. Her brother who just graduated last year has his own business. And as a young entrepreneur, he is also challenged with increased costs to meet his business dreams. Our property is surrounded by two dairies. One is a 10,000 cow operation and the other is almost a thousand cow operation. Today, both dairies are working with a company that will collect their cow manure from the pens, transport it to very large tanks that will extract the methane gas from the manure, then recapture it. The manure is sucked out of the tanks and returned to the dairy for the next process. The captured methane gas is transported to a company that will then use it as a renewable energy source. Other dairies are in line to do the same kind of plan. The scenarios lead back to my initial comment that when private industry and government really work together, creating mutual benefits, solutions to all, it's a win, win, win. We ask as Colorado natives, Minnesotans, and grandparents that you strongly consider the long and short-term effects of any regulations onto the citizens and how it's affecting our Colorado way of life. Positive changes have been and are continuing to be made in many areas. Regulations to me are almost like surgeons. Colorado wasn't doing so well, so the surgeons decided it needed to be operated on. What concerns me is that they're gonna have- Mr. your time has expired. If you could wrap up, that'd be great. Thank yeah. you. So the surgeons have a surgery, have an operation, and they come out and say, hey, the operation was a success, but the, color, but the patient died. Let's not, Colorado, let's not let Colorado die with all these regulations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Lowe, for being here today and providing comment. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Sutherland. Ms. Sutherland, you're impaneled. If you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, we can hear your thoughts today. There we go. Hi there. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is My name is Grace Sutherland, and I'm a Colorado native. I've lived in Denver all of my life, and I'm an avid outdoors uh, activist where I enjoy many of the different uh, activities that are outdoors. 21 years ago, I moved to Byers, Colorado in Arapahoe County, and I have a small ranch on 40 acres, which is adjacent to a horse sanctuary. I rely on propane to heat my home and fuel to run my equipment throughout the seasons. And everyone in our community also lives off of propane and also fuel to run their equipment as well. <clears throat> Even though I'm on propane, I still have to run my electricity, which operates my furnace. And in this past winter season, my monthly bill was on average $340. It would be catastrophic if I had to pay more. I see the wells being erected and it has no impact on myself as I encourage the drilling. I, with the drilling specifically, it allows us an opportunity to be able to grow. Uh, I still travel to work uh, to and from town. That's about 60 miles uh, one way. Uh, so I rely on the fuel to get me to that place of employment. I would uh, really appreciate if you could please consider the positive effects that the oil and gas industry has on Colorado and all of its communities, because we all can really utilize and appreciate it as we have for centuries. 
And I do thank you for your valuable time and consideration today to actively hear from each one of us. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland, for being here today and providing your thoughts. Um, next up, we've got Ms. Anderson. Good morning, members of the commission. I'm Lori Anderson, a Broomfield City Council member. I appreciate your continued work towards evaluating and addressing the cumulative impacts of oil and gas development. As you are aware, this effort is of utmost importance to my constituents and other communities impacted by oil and gas development, as well as to the state's climate and ozone goals. I recently testified before the commission regarding the cumulative impacts rulemaking, focusing on the SB 181 legislative charge re requiring all cumulative impacts of oil and gas development be addressed, not just air quality, but also impacts to public health, water, soil, bi biological resources, and disproportionately impacted communities. I provided detailed comments on the extensive list of cumulative impacts and that list of impacts still applies and the time to address them is now. It has been almost four years since the passage of SB 181. Although incremental progress has been made in complying with the cumulative impacts directives, the efforts fall short of meaningfully and effectively addressing the urgency to respond to the climate crisis, the urgency to respond to the ozone crisis facing the North Front Range, and the urgency to address the cumulative impacts across Colorado. The COGCC has acknowledged that much more is needed to be done by way of rulemaking to not only continue building evaluation data, but also to address those evaluated impacts as required. The 2022 Cumulative Impacts Report is an improvement over the original version and does a good job of publishing data and showing trends for some cumulative impacts compiled in cooperation with the other agencies, including impacts on water usage, impacts to wildlife, land use, air quality, and GHG emissions. However, Rule 904A8 provides that the report should include recommendations about future rulemakings, guidance, work groups, or studies to address the cumulative impacts data collected. Although much data is being collected, there's little acknowledgement of health, no data on noise, which results in stress, anxiety, and lack of sleep, no compilation of data based on health impacts for those living near multiple well sites and other critical compilations that would inform the commission at what point no further wells can be approved for any given community to ensure that the COGCC's mission to protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment is truly achieved. It is critical and equally important that the data is analyzed and subsequently used to address the cumulative impacts. This is where the report falls short. The CIDR database must be enhanced to provide the framework to guide future data gathering to inform necessary comprehensive cumulative impact analyses. Additionally, the COGCC should explicitly mandate that climate change impacts be evaluated. Critical is consideration of how permitting an operation interfaces with the statutory, statutorily prescribed GHG emission reduction requirements of the oil and gas sector. Much data is effectively being collected, but the lack of planning for what to do with that data to address ozone and greenhouse gas emissions is a major deficiency in the report. Please don't conflate impact minimization with actions to avoid those impacts altogether, such as delaying or denying new development permits. Impact minimization is not the same as establishing enforceable limits on the impacts. The cumulative impacts plan that operators must submit with their permit application is required to demonstrate that their plans avoid, minimize, and mitigate adverse impacts but these plans simply focus on what the operator is doing to minimize impacts, which is not always consistent with full protection of people, the environment and wildlife. Therefore, I urge the commission to initiate the cumulative impacts rulemaking as soon as possible to adopt rules that not only evaluate impacts, but also address them to prevent further harm by oil and gas development to communities and our fragile environment. We have no time to waste. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson for being here with us today and providing your thoughts. Um, I believe next up we have Ms. Compton. Hi. Hi. Um, my name's Sharon Compton. I was born in Texas in 1942. I grew up in Midland, Texas. My family background is farming, ranching, and oil. My grandfather, Ralph Overholzer, was a pioneer in the development of the Permian Basin oil industry in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico. My father, Carl, was also in that business. I grew up right in the heart of the oil patch where oil wells were drilled and put into production. The economy was strong and jobs were plentiful. Businesses, schools, and churches were thriving and well supported. Communities were clean and skies were blue. My family moved to Grand Junction, Colorado in 1956. 
1956 and I fell in love with Colorado. I graduated from Grand Junction High School in 1960 and from the University of Denver in 1964. Conservation and ecology are subjects very dear to my heart. Colorado is a beautiful state and I understand and share the desire to keep our state pristine and clean. But there is no such thing as green energy. There is an environmental cost to producing any type of energy, whether it is the use of fossil fuels, sun, wind, geothermal, or nuclear. All energy producing methods require manufacturing, which depends on drilling, mining, water usage, smelting, and or space. Many of these processes require the use of large equipment and or extreme heat, which can only be obtained by using diesel and coal. The mining of lithium, cobalt, nickel, cadmium, lead, and acid used to make batteries for storing electricity uses tremendous amounts of water and leaves the water toxic to plants and animals. In countries such as China, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile, satellite images reveal large areas of land and coastline devoid of life. Towns have found toxic waste from mining these materials in their domestic water supplies. This all comes from the mining of these minerals. Also the disposal of all these different elements uh, is a concern. Um, things have to go into um, landfills and uh, batteries, the acids and the minerals leach into the soil. And these are especially disturbing. Um, all infrastructure for, for producing power has a visual impact. Consider the visual impact of large banks of wind turbines blocking the view for miles, large banks of solar collectors reflecting the sun and taking up vast acres of land. Aesthetically, do we want to look at acres and acres of solar panels or acres and acres of wind turbines? With modern drilling techniques, there's very little visual or discernible evidence of a finished and producing well. Destruction or serious reduction of the oil and gas industry in America is a grave and strategically dangerous mistake. By shutting down or strictly limiting exploration and drilling at home in favor of importing petroleum and mi mined minerals from foreign countries, we leave ourselves vulnerable to shortages beyond our control. The political pressures to strictly Ms. Compton, limit the time has elapsed. So I wonder if you could wrap up for could us, please. Produce catastrophe, catastrophe for America. I ask you to seriously reconsider placing more crippling restrictions on an industry that is so vital to the security and sovereignty of America. Thank you for being here with us today and providing your comments. We appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Jewell. Yeah, uh, my name is Dave Jewell, and I'd like to thank the Commission for allowing citizens to comment on the issues and decisions that affect them. I have lived in Northern Colorado for 50 years, where I own my own business, raised three children who attended public schools, and I'm a proud taxpayer to support the infrastructure from which my family, neighbors and citizens have benefited. My business in Colorado and the supporting states support hundreds of business associates and families. I was able to pass my business down to family, which continues to support these and many more as the business continues to grow. The taxes these businesses and families pay are important to the financial support of the infrastructure and recreation areas of Colorado. My wife and I are now retired with children and grandchildren in Colorado, and we plan to enjoy the lifestyle of this state to support both government and private enterprise with our taxes and disposable income. We are deeply concerned about what we see of the rising cost of living here and decisions which this commission makes along with what our legislature and local governments mandate will make it more expensive on fixed in income citizens. 
The current inflation rate on electricity, heating, fuel prices are running at all time highs. This began with SB 181 in 2019, which curtailed the highly regulated oil and gas industry in our, the state. This resulted in the loss of billions of tax dollars, which supported schools, infrastructure, and the like. I have reviewed part of the February report on the cumulative impacts on oil, air quality, which include primarily drilling and agriculture. There is so much more which a jet, jet stream brings into our state. Decisions made from this report could have many unintended consequences. Please consider all these issues. Many items that are part of our lives are produced with fossil fuels and will be needed for many years to come. Even the electricity produced for electric vehicles are mainly produced from these sources. We need all sources of energy, including renewables. So I ask that you carefully consider the, all the effects. Thanks for taking your time to listen to citizens who will be affected by uh, your decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jewell, for being here today and providing your comments. Um, I believe that was the last public commenter uh, that we had available in the meeting today to provide public comment. Um, with that, I'll uh, reiterate that if folks uh, are interested in providing written comment or sharing the comments that they provided verbally today in, in a written format, we're more than happy to accept those. Um, with that, I would recommend that we take a five minute break uh, and then return at 1130 where we'd have an opportunity for commissioners to provide comments on the report. Let's get started here again. Um, I want to just take a quick second and thank all the different individuals that uh, took time out of their days to provide public comment on the cumulative impacts report. Um, the, uh, the specific public comment that was to the report is certainly helpful uh, to both COGCC staff and the commission and ensuring that uh, future reports um, can be can evolve and continue to be improved um, as we uh, continue to develop cumulative impacts reporting moving forward. Um, with that, we do have an opportunity now as commissioners to provide comment to staff on the um, cumulative impacts report that was provided and who wants to start? Mr. Commissioner Ray. Thank you, Commissioner Messer. On behalf of Executive Director uh, Dan Gibbs, I just want to thank all the commission staff who worked on this report uh, and thank all the members of the public who submitted written and oral comments. This is a really important process and public engagement is critical uh, and the work of the staff is essential to inform the commission's work. So just want to express our thanks to, to both staff and the public who engaged in the process. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Ray. Uh, totally concur with those thoughts. Other commissioners, Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I, I echo the comments of Commissioner Ray. I know a lot of work went into this, this um, most recent report. I think for myself, this report has so much more information than our first report did, right? Because it's an iterative process. We're building on data that's being collected over time from CIDR, from our partner agencies and trying to put all those pieces together. It's a work in progress. Um, I, I realize that it, it doesn't have everything in it yet. I mean, um, one of the big pieces I think that we are want or looking forward to reviewing is what do we, how do emissions align or not align in the form 2Bs where they were operators giving us estimates of emissions, but we have to wait until they actually turn in their actual emissions over at CDPHE to make those comparisons. And because of the cycle of oil and gas, you know, there's a significant lag between they come when they come to us and say, this is what we want to do. And then it actually ha starts happening and they collect that data and turn it in over to CDPHE. So I, I, I acknowledge that there are pieces that are still missing, but I do think that this report is a, is a big leap forward. And I appreciate also that pieces were added based on commissioner comments after the first report. Um, I, for me personally, um, I have nothing that I feel I need to amend or change from the current report. There are things that I would be interested in 
looking at and discussing for the next report, but I, I wonder if that's gonna be folded into our cumulative impacts um, work coming up with Commissioner Ackerman. I know there's also work happening with CDPHE um, in particular around the ozone and NOx and getting into attainment. And so um, I don't, I guess I, I feel like as part of this iterative process, I'd like to see how these other pieces play out and evolve and then decide or figure out how we can add that information or that data to next year's cumulative impacts report. I also really um, want to compliment staff. The, the high priority habitat information really wasn't available last, uh, the first cumulative impacts report. And I found that also very helpful um, information to have as part of the, the report. I understand, I think water is super important. Um, and I appreciate that we've added some information about how much water, the, the source of the water. And I think there's maybe some additional work we could use or, or create around water quantity and water quality in our cumulative impacts report. Um, but I guess I'm looking forward to uh, using our processes that we have upcoming that we've talked a lot about to just figure out if there are things that we can add more near term for the next year's report or if anything, that, any decisions that we make might result in, it's gonna take some time to get those things integrated into the report. Sorry, it's kind of a circular conversation, but um, those are my thoughts. Great, thank you, Commissioner McGowan. Very thoughtful. Um, Commissioner Oath. Thanks, thanks, Commissioner Mesner. Um, I too would echo the, the thanks and, and comments of appreciation from the previous commissioners. Um, a lot of work clearly has gone into this and agree with you, Commissioner McGowan, that you know this report um, in incorporates a lot of additional information and yet it, we're gonna continue to get there, right? And so um, to, your, to your comment about the ability in the future to be able to fully compare um, what's in the CIDR database with what's in um, CDPHE's oil and gas inventory. I think we'll be able to do that in the coming years um, as, you know, sort of that lag and that time gap closes. Um, and that's when I think, you know, we'll have a lot of really information and be able to really shore up kind of those estimates going forward in the future for OGDPs that come forward to you all. Um, so I think that this work is, is really helpful to get us there. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, I don't have any specific suggestions for changes for, to the report for upcoming years to get us there. I think that, you know, the, that we're, we're teed up in a really good way um, in that regard. I mean, cumulative impacts in general is obviously, um, there's a lot, you know, this report is a piece of those conversations. Um, you know, there is, you know, additional work ongoing. Um, for implementation of the EJ task force recommendations that, you know, talk about cumulative impacts that will, you know, be evolving through the course of this year, as well as, you know, potential legislative direction this session, um, and then, you know, the stakeholder process that you all have underway. And so it is going to be really important for the COGCC to sort of figure out how to pull those various pieces together in a cohesive way, you know, in accordance with you know, your, your directives and authorities. And I think, you know, that will be important, really important work going forward. Great, thanks for that. Always good to hear CDPHE's perspective on these things. Um, Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I appreciate Commissioner Ellis' comments as well as the others. And mine are very similar. You know, I've read this important report and studied it in its entirety. And I also wanted to echo Commissioner McGowan in thanking staff for hearing the requests that we put forth and including those items in this report, that's how that's supposed to work. It's supposed to be iterative and we're supposed to continue to build on it as time goes on. And I see lots of opportunities for us to be able to do that. Like Commissioner Oath, uh, something I've pondered a lot is that this is indeed a piece of what we're doing from the cumulative impacts perspective. And the, the regulation 904 kind of sets forth a bit of a linear path for the commission in studying cumulative impacts every year, making recommendations in this report, and then moving forward with any kind of implementation subsequent to this report. Because what we have now is various ongoing overlapping processes, uh, you know, it's not as linear now as hopefully it will be in the future as we continue to hone in on the important actions that the commission can take. And so I too would echo Commissioner Oath in saying that we have a lot of work to do to marry these uh, processes uh, that are ongoing and understand, uh, you know, 
what pieces of our cumulative impacts puzzle can be handled in which process. Um, and I think that'll be uh, a lot of good work that we can continue to do in the process that I've been leading that you mentioned uh, going forward. So I appreciate the report. I, I really think it's going to be an excellent tool in perpetuity. I think the commission was uh, was very forward looking in creating an opportunity to make cumulative impacts evaluation analysis and addressing an annual um, process and an annual opportunity to suggest improvements. So I, I look forward to that and I appreciate the uh, public comments that were made today and uh, and and the opportunity to share some thoughts. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. <clears throat> Commissioner Cross, do you have thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just be brief. Uh, I also wanna thank the staff for the work put into this report. And I wanna thank everyone for their public comments today. Um, Overall, I, I do believe that this is helpful and we're taking a step in the right direction. And I just wanna make sure that we give the appropriate time to be able to collect the data necessary to make rules and, and decisions moving forward. Um, and so thank you again to everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Cross. Um, I don't have a lot more to add. I think the uh, my fellow commissioners certainly um, brought up some good points. I do wanna thank staff for um, for the work that was done on this, not only COGCC staff, but CPW, CDPHE, uh, Colorado Energy Office, and others that were involved with this. This is a huge undertaking um, and uh, relatively unique in the regulatory, regulatory agencies' um, uh, processes. And so I think that um, there was huge steps taken from the first year's uh, cumulative impacts report to the second year. A lot of that had to do with more data available uh, for analysis. And uh, I agree with Commissioner McGowan that this, um, that some of the other processes that are happening concurrent to this um, will be important in informing what may occur in a 2023 cumulative impacts report and how we can continue to evolve the cumulative impacts report to really develop the data necessary to make informed uh, science-based decisions uh, in our regulatory processes. And I think that, uh, that this is a strong step as far as how we've evaluated 2022 information. Um, I am also looking forward to how we, um, how we put together actuals um, with um, anticipated um, cumulative impacts that were provided in the CIDR database or the cumulative impacts reports. Um, and I think that you know the full evaluation of all the different elements, um, whether that's wildlife, whether that's water, whether that's you know ozone or air, whether that's biological resources, whether that's public health impacts, um, are all evaluated um, both with um, the information that's provided by the operators, um, you know, in their two B reports as well as actuals that are provided and other mechanisms afterwards. And so um, I'm interested to see us continue to move uh, those combined, that combined information forward. So, uh, so thank you to staff and thank you again to the public commenters today. Uh, do other commissioners have additional thoughts um, or does staff have any additional thoughts before we conclude today's meeting? Well, with that, uh, this concludes uh, today's special hearing on feedback for the cumulative impacts report. Uh, I think we do need to take a motion to adjourn uh, to end today's meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Well, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all for your participation today and uh, um, we will see you later on in the week.